video is very visually satisfying to me. I don't know why. I just enjoy watching that. Uh, great to have you with us today, everyone. As I mentioned last week, I'm really excited about this series that we're in on the book of Ecclesiastes. And my excitement stems from the fact that as I was studying Ecclesiastes this summer, God really used it in my own life. Issues that I have struggled with for, for 20, 30 years, God really brought clarity and direction to my life. And so I believe it can be a game-changing series for you as well. We would love for you to read the book of Ecclesiastes with us. And to do that, you can download the Eagle Brook Church app. If you don't have that already, there's a lot of great stuff on there. Download the Eagle Brook Church app. You can also find it on our website. Or if you want, just take a paper Bible, open it up, and start reading. Okay, you could do that as well. That would be just fine. Now, why the title Living Life Backward? Well, the title Living Life Backward, and first of all, came from this book by Dave Gibson called Living Life Backward, and it is a great book. And I just wanted to let you know, I've used this book throughout the series, so I'm not going to quote him every time I'm using him, but you should just know we're using this book throughout the series. You should pick it up. It's a great book. The second reason why we title it Living Life Backwards is because what is the one certainty of life? What is the one thing in your life, in your future, that you know is going to happen? Like, it's not a maybe, it's not a probably, it is an absolute certainty. It's our death. Here's the premise of this series. Here's the big idea of this series. A proper perspective on death is the key to true life. That when you say, here's what I know for certain in the future... And then you start to work your way backwards and say, in light of that, how should I live? That's when you start to live with purpose. That's when life becomes powerful. Today's message is titled, Bursting the Bubble. Because in chapters 1 and 2 of Ecclesiastes, the author is going to poke at some things that we believe that aren't exactly true. He's going to burst some bubbles, and here's the one he's going to burst this week. It's, more will satisfy me. About eight years ago, our family went to South Carolina on a vacation, and I took our two oldest sons to play tennis, and so my wife took our younger two kids at the time on a walk. And she was on this pathway, and it was flanked by a road on one side and a canal on the other, and as she was walking, she saw this sign that came up along the path. We had just watched Swamp People the night before, so this was very concerning to us when we saw this Sign About a hundred yards down the path, my wife was pointing out some turtles that were sort of suntanning on a log to our kids, when all of a sudden she looked down and about two feet from her was an alligator. No exaggeration, it had like blended into the grass and it was about two feet from her. To hear my daughter, who was four years old at the time, tell the story, mommy went, ah, and ran into the bush. I said to Sarah, I said, did you just leave our kids standing by the alligator? She said, no, they ran after me. <laughs> Everyone for themselves, apparently, in that moment. My wife did grab our youngest son, but she just didn't have hands. And so my daughter had to just figure it out. Good lesson for her. Hey, just follow mom into the bush. But here's a picture of this alligator that was along the path that she took a picture of. It was a pretty decent-sized alligator. I want to go back to that first sign, though, for just a moment. And I want to focus in on the bottom part here where it says a fed at gator is a dead gator. I asked the guy at the hotel, I said, well, what, what does that mean? He said, well, alligators always want more. So if you feed alligators, then they start to approach strangers and approach people, and that's really dangerous. He said, that's why the sign is there. Alligators always want more. I thought people are the same way. We, we always want more. We want more house. We want more car. We want more spouse. We want more vacation time. We want more free time. We want more pleasure. We want more money. We always want more. But here's my question. What if we weren't dependent upon more for our happiness? See, more is never satisfied. It's because more is a black hole. Even when you get more house, there's always more that you could get. Even when you get more free time, there's always more that you could get. More is never satisfied. More is never enough. And therefore, more is never happy. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the author asks this question, what is ultimately going to satisfy a human soul? 
And I would even ask you, what, what do you think? What, what is ultimately going to satisfy your soul? I use the word ultimately because, of course, there's lots of things that satisfy us for a short period of time, but don't end up lasting. So what is it that ultimately satisfies a human soul? Before we get to the answer to that question, I want to give you a little background into the book of Ecclesiastes. It was probably written by a man named King Solomon. Now, that's disputed. Some scholars are like, no, I don't think so. But, but here's why most believe it was Solomon. In verse 1 of the book, it says, these are the words of King David's son who ruled in Jerusalem. King Solomon was David's son, and he succeeded him as king. When was the book of Ecclesiastes written? Well, we don't know for certain, but it doesn't really matter. Because it's not a historical narrative. In other words, there's not a chronological history of events that took place. It's written in a genre of literature known as wisdom literature, which means it's more like reflections on life. Solomon was, by all accounts, the wisest and wealthiest person of his day. But this might surprise you because at times throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, he sounds like a depressed French philosopher. You look at what he writes in verse 3. He says, everything is meaningless, utterly meaningless. That's the second verse of chapter 1. That's a verse you're not going to find on your next coffee mug. That's not a verse you're going to find on your next Hallmark card. Hey, happy birthday, congratulations, another trip around the sun in your meaningless, utterly meaningless life. <laughs> you're just not going to see that verse. Solomon uses this word meaningless 37 times in a short 12-chapter book. But the Hebrew word that we translate as meaningless, it carries with it kind of a deeper connotation carries with it the idea of breath or breeze, mist or vapor, or a puff of smoke. Up here with me, I have a candle. And I'm going to go ahead and light this candle on fire for just a moment. Our facilities crew loves it when I light things on fire in the middle of the message. But I tell them, hey, what could go wrong, right? What could go wrong? Now, I'm actually going to blow this out pretty quickly. And it's going to be hard to see with the lights. But when I blow this out, what's going to happen? It's not a trick candle. I'm not a magician. You're going you're to see a puff of smoke, right? Now, here's what's interesting about this puff of smoke. It's real. I mean, you can see it. You can smell it. But it's also transient. It disappears rather quickly. It's also elusive. If, if I try to grab that smoke and put it in my pocket, as soon as my fingers get, cl get close to it, it just sort of moves away. Solomon says, that's life. Our life here on earth, it's a mist, it's a vapor, it's a puff of smoke. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And if you think we can control life and we can control our death, we can't. It's elusive. The moment we try to control it, it, it slips out of our grip. Solomon goes on in verse Three, he says, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? He says, generations come and go, but nothing really changes. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. In the next verse, he says, and in future generations, no one will remember what we're doing now. And somebody give this guy a hug, right? But he's not a masochist, he's actually a realist. What Solomon wants each of us to do is to reflect. He wants us to look at the world in which we live, and he wants us to look at our own human experience, and then he wants us to ask the question, how should we live? So today I want to give you one truth from our world that you can observe. I want to show us one truth from human experience, and then I want to ask the question, how should we live? Here's the truth that we can observe from our world. The sun is chasing its tail. What I mean by that is the world we live in is not linear, it's cyclical. The sun rises in the morning, it sets at night, and the next day, it's going to rise again. It rains, 
The rain goes into the streams. The streams flow into the ocean. The water evaporates and goes into the clouds. It rains into the streams, and the cycle begins again. The sun is chasing its tail. Solomon goes on in verse 11. He says, in future generations, no one's going to remember what we're doing now. Let me ask you, do you know anything about your great-great-grandparents? Do you know their name? Do you know things about their life? Most people don't. Most people don't even know their great-grandparents, let alone their great-great-grandparents. And that's Solomon's point. What he's saying here is, that's going to be us. In two to three generations, no one is going to remember us. People will hardly remember Justin Bieber let alone Jason Strand. He says people aren't going to remember what we're doing now. Solomon goes on in the next few verses to say, if you think your life is such a big deal, then how come rocks and mountains outlast us? Your lawn that you walk on, it might outlive you. I mean, think about that next time you walk on it. It might outlive us. The sun is chasing its tail. Our family was up at Grand Marais, which is off the North Shore this summer in northern Minnesota. And it's a great town. As you come into town, there's kind of a beach on the side. And I don't know if this is a boy thing. I think it's got to be. I could skip rocks for hours. I don't know what it is. I, I, when I see the rock go across the water and it goes, boop, 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 and it's like nine skips, I lose my mind. I'm like, I just got a nine skipper. I'm just going nuts. And so me and my sons, right away, we start skipping rocks, and we're doing this for quite a long time, having a good time. And all of a sudden, I looked over, and I saw this gentleman. He's in about his mid-80s, and he was sitting on a park bench just watching our family intently. A little bit later, my wife walked past this man, and with a mixture of sort of emotional, teary-eyed, and a smile on his face, he said, I really enjoyed watching your family skip rocks this morning. He said, my brother and I used to come up here as boys, and we would skip rocks on that same beach. He said, my brother is gone now. He's been gone for a couple of years. But it was really fun to think of that memory as I watched your family. Here was this man in his mid-80s, sitting by himself on a bench. His brother is gone, and the life just went on. The world just went on. It always does. The sun is chasing its tail. Here's what we know is true about our human experience. We are chasing the wind. So if the sun is chasing its tail, we are chasing the wind. Solomon, the author, goes on a quest. He wants to figure out what is going to bring meaning and purpose to my life. And maybe you've done something like this before where you're like, I just feel this sense of emptiness. I need to find some meaning and purpose. And so he goes on this quest and he starts out with education. And here's what he says. He says, look, I'm wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. But now I realize that even that was like chasing the wind. I love this phrase, chasing the wind. I mean, imagine if you woke up and you saw someone in your front yard and they were just running back and forth. And you went outside and you said, what are you doing? And they said, I'm chasing the wind. (laughs) 911. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy to chase the wind. It's futile to chase the wind. You can't catch it. But Solomon says that's what a lot of us do in life. We're looking for a sense of meaning and purpose, but we're chasing something that won't give it to us. Even something as good as education. We think, well, if I could get my college degree, and if I could get my master's degree, and if I could get accredited, and if I could get some initials before or after my name. Problem is, you could get all those things. You could still feel a sense of emptiness. So Solomon says, well, if if it's not education, maybe it's pleasure. Maybe some good old-fashioned hedonism will do the trick here. And so here's what he says in the next verse. Come now, let's give pleasure a try. But I found that this too was meaningless. Silly to be laughing all the time, I said. What good does it do to seek only pleasure? After much thought, I decided... I'll cheer myself with some wine. While seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. It's a great statement. In this way, I hope to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. 
Solomon wakes up the next morning and realizes pleasure ain't it. I mean, I feel worse now than I did before. Yeah, it temporarily made me feel good, but there's no deeper sense of meaning here. And so he moves on to material wealth and acquisition. Says that he had workers who built palaces and vineyards and gardens, and he had workers who could take care of all of it. So he didn't have to do the work himself. I was watching a show on ESPN about Floyd Mayweather, the boxer, and they were touring one of his houses. He has several, and this was one in Las Vegas, and it was 20,000 square feet. But the amazing part was he brought the camera crew down to his garage where he had seven cars that were valued at $15 million. At one point, Floyd Mayweather just kind of off the cuff mentioned that a couple of those cars he had never driven before. I thought, what? You have seven cars that value at $15 million and you've never found the time to just spin them around the block one time? Now here's what's shocking. King Solomon's wealth would have made Floyd Mayweather look like a pauper. King Solomon collected gold and silver. Just a little hobby of his. Hey, what do you collect? I collect stamps. What do you collect? I collect gold and silver. He would have concerts at his palace. In other words, he didn't go to the U2 concert. He brought U2 to his house and had the concert in his backyard. Says he could have any woman whenever he wanted. And so here's how Solomon concluded. He said, I had everything a man could desire. Everything. Anything I wanted, I took. I did not restrain myself from any joy, but as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. It was like chasing the wind. Anyone here today chasing the wind? Anyone here today, if you were honest about your life and what you've been spending your time on, you would say, you know what, I've been chasing the wind. I I feel this low-grade sense of dissatisfaction. There's this void or emptiness in my spirit. And I thought that relationship would fill it. But then we broke up, and I moved on to a different relationship, and, and that didn't do it either. And then I thought, maybe success, maybe pleasure... Maybe other people liking me or thinking well of me, maybe that will fill the void. But it's all just chasing the wind. The question I want to ask you today is this, how much longer? How much longer are we going to chase the wind? I know people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and older who have been chasing the wind for decades. Even in my own life, as I've reflected on this, I've gone through seasons where I thought, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy, so I'm going to pursue happiness. And I would pursue it, and it would just sort of slip out of my grasp. And so then I would say, well, maybe it's performance. Maybe if I'm really successful and people look at me positively, that will fill the void. It did. And then I thought, well, maybe it's pleasure. I just want to feel good. You know, I, I, sometimes I feel really good, God, and other times I don't. Maybe it's that. And all of it is chasing the wind. My wife's grandmother is in her 80s. I believe she's been married for 67 years. And she has been walking with God for a very long time. And several years ago, she wrote some advice to her grandchildren. But it wasn't the advice that you would normally hear people share. Instead, she talked about the book of Ecclesiastes. In this email to her grandchildren, she said, In my lifetime, we have raised our standard of living... But studies show that joy and contentment have decreased. Seems the more we have, the more we want. She wrote, today we have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences and less time, more possessions and less value. We've cleaned the air but polluted the soul. She said, as Solomon writes, nothing is new under the sun. Here was Solomon's exact words. He says, what has been, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. 
Solomon wants each of us to learn that the world is just going to keep going. It's the sun chasing its tail. We are oftentimes chasing the wind. And so the question that Solomon wants us to ask is this, how should we live? If all these other things aren't going to bring meaning and purpose to our life, how should a person live? Let's pretend for just a moment that you got the promotion. I mean, you always wanted this promotion. It came with a big raise, and you went out and bought the vacation home of your dreams. And then let's just pretend for a moment that all of your kids are doing extremely well. They do well in school. They've got great jobs, and they are off and running in life. And let's just pretend that you married the perfect spouse. We're just pretending, okay? We're just pretending. <laughs> but just imagine you married the perfect spouse, and you guys never fought with one another. And then you found the perfect house, and you were never tempted to move again. And then let's just imagine that next week there was no laundry to do. <laughs> Woo! The marriage didn't get you too excited, but the laundry, you're like, yeah, now you're talking. <laughs> there's no laundry, there's no school runs, there's no to-do list, there's no errands. You just get all this free time to do whatever you want to do. Here's the question, would you be satisfied? And you think, well, maybe, <laughs> it sounds pretty good. But human experience teaches us that after a while, that satisfaction would wear off. That circumstances don't provide meaning and purpose in a person's life. That after a week or a year or 10 years, at some point, you'd wake up and you'd go, you know, I just, I just don't feel satisfied. This has been a struggle for me for years. I was looking back at some old prayer journals. And these were prayer journals that I kept from when I was in my 20s, my early 30s. And I thought, for years, I believed this lie. For years, I thought, if I can just control my life, if I can just get my life just right, then I'll be satisfied and then I'll be content. And so I thought, if I just organize my schedule, and I get my schedule just organized perfectly, and if I can plan out our family vacations and plan out what sports the kids are going to play, and if I can get all my habits, you know, if I spend time with God, and if I exercise, if I get all those things just right, then I'll finally be content. I'll finally be satisfied. Here's what I'm learning these days. As I read through the book of Ecclesiastes, what I'm learning is that life is a gift. There's no formula. You get what God gives. And we can't control what God gives. And so these days, I wake up in the morning and I say, God, what do you have for me today? It might be a good day. It might not be a good day. But I'm going to trust God that you see things that I don't see and you know things that I don't know. And even if it's not a great day, I believe you can use that for my good. And it doesn't mean that I don't have meetings on the calendar. I do. It doesn't mean I don't try to spend time with God every day. I absolutely do that as well. But it just means that I no longer believe that if I get my life just right, that I will be satisfied and content. At the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, here was Solomon's conclusion. And we really ought to read the book from chapter 1 to 12 because he, he kind of at the very end gives us the conclusion. He says, here's my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands. How should we live? Fear God and obey his commands. His commands, for this is the duty of every person. God will judge us for everything that we do, including every secret thing. I remember reading that for the first time and thinking to myself, really? Like that, that, that's the conclusion of the book is to fear God and obey his commands. That's what's going to bring meaning and purpose to our life. Because you can fear God and you can still feel empty you can obey God and still feel lonely. So why does he say that we should fear God and obey him? And that's what's going to bring fulfillment and meaning to a person's life. I think because Solomon understood something very important. He understood that death is the one certainty of our life. And in light of our death, we know that we will stand before God. And what is God going to do? He's going to judge us for everything, including every secret thing. And in that moment, what's going to matter is, did we fear God and did we obey his commands? You know, most of us will spend our last days in a bed just like this. 
flat on our back. That's a harsh reality, but it's true. As someone who's been a pastor since I was 21 years old, I've been in a fair number of hospital rooms with beds like these. I remember one time I was with a woman who had been married for 60 years. Her and her husband were watching a movie. He got up to go take a shower, and that's where she found him. And I remember walking out of her hospital room that day, and I had almost a holy moment in the hallway. I just stopped, and I thought, God, that is going to be me someday. And it was so surreal, because I couldn't even wrap my mind around it. I was like, I just, I can't picture that. Like, I know I'm going to age, I know I'm going to get older, but it's just so surreal to think that one day we're going to be at that spot. And what I've noticed is when I've spent time in hospital rooms, I've never had someone come to me and say, hey, could you just do me a quick favor? Could you go over to my house? Down in my basement, I've got some golf trophies and some fishing trophies and my kid, they, they, he won a basketball tournament in sixth grade. Could you grab those and bring them over? I just want to hold them as I die. Never had someone say that. I've never had someone say to me, could you go to the bank and cash out my account, bring the cash over? I just want to hold it as I meet my maker. I've never had someone say, hey, go get my BMW and park it outside. I just, I just want to look at it while I meet God. Those aren't the kind of conversations that people have at the end of life. At the end of our life, there are two questions that every person asks. These are the two questions that everybody I have sat with in a room like this has asked these two questions. The first one is, are you right with your family? And the second question is, are you right with God? I want to ask you today, are you right with your family? Some of us might need to make a phone call, send a text message or an email, and just say, I am so sorry, would you forgive me? I want to try again. I know it's not going to be right away. There might be some steps and take it slow, but I really want a relationship with you. There are some of us who maybe we've been distracted and we've just been chasing the wind. And there's people at home who love us more than anyone and who need us more than anyone. And often they kind of get our leftovers because we're out chasing the wind. I want to ask you today, are you right with your family? And then I want to ask you, are you right with God? You see, if there is no eternity, our lives on earth are pretty meaningless. And yeah, you could try to feel as good as you can for your 70, 80, whatever years, but eventually you're going to die and you're going to be in the ground as worm food. It's just not a lot of meaning. You say, well, I want the world to be a better place, so I'm going to leave the world better for the next generation. I mean, that's great. But what for what? I mean, they're, they're going to die and go into the ground, and it's just going to keep going and going and going. It just is a circle. Without eternity, there's, there's not a lot of meaning and purpose in life. But Jesus Christ came to our earth. He walked on our earth. He died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins and to defeat death once and for all. And Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will receive the gift of eternal life. Our lives here on earth have deep meaning and purpose. Because how we live our 70, 80, or whatever years determines where we will spend eternity forever. And Jesus says, I want you to be with me in paradise. Are you right with God. Tuesday morning of this week, my wife called me on the phone and she said that her grandma, not the one who had written the note I referenced earlier, but on the other side of her family, had passed away the night before. It was just this week. 
And her grandma Iris was a person that I know was a servant, was always serving people. And she had a deep love for Jesus Christ. Do you know someone like that? When you meet them, you go, wow, they just, there's something, they love Jesus. And so as I initially was so sad for the family and for Grandma Iris, I also started to feel this deep joy for her. Grandma Iris is with Jesus. And she loved Jesus. She had five miscarriages. And she will now see those five children that she's never met before in heaven for all of eternity. I know that she was right with God. And so I want to ask you today, are you right with God? Have you had a moment in your life where you say, God, I give my life to you. I surrender to Jesus Christ. Maybe you say, you know what? I, I have done that in my life, but right now I don't, I'm not right with God. There's a sin I need to confess. I need to repent of. I've been out chasing the wind, focused on things that are not eternal. And I want to give you an opportunity today to get right with God. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you pray this prayer for the first time to give your life to Christ, would you just take a moment and text the word BEGIN to 77888? And I hate having to do that in the middle of an emotional moment like this, but it's so important. We want you to start a relationship with God. And we have some free resources we want to put in your hands. So if you pray this prayer, send that text. Let me pray for us at all of our campuses. Lord, one day, our life on this earth is going to end. And that's really hard to even think about, God. It's, it's hard to picture. Or it feels so surreal. But Lord, in that moment, the two questions that we're going to ask is, are we right with our family and are we right with you? God, right now, if there's someone here who's not right with their family, would you give them the strength and the courage to reach out and to take a step and to do what they can to live in peace with everyone. And God, if there's someone who's not right with you, right now, God, they're going to pray in the quietness of their own mind. God, I want to get right with you. I want a relationship with you. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for my sins. God, I confess my sins, I turn from them, and I put my faith in Christ. Lord, I receive the gift of eternal life. God, others of us have been chasing the wind, and we've been focused on things of this world far more than we've been focused on things of eternity. Right now, we set our minds on things above. We set our minds on heaven. We set our thoughts on you. And we want to recalibrate right now, God. We want to return to you. God, I thank you that you are a God that is always available, that you always hear our prayers, and that you're always willing to take us back. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here. Next week, week two of this series, Living Life Backwards, is going to be good. You won't want to miss it. We'll see you then.